Good day, and today you are here to learn about William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience. But first, the life of William Blake. Blake was born in London in 1757. His early education came primarily from his mother at home, where they read mostly from the Bible. Now, Blake was a bit of a madman and began having visions at an early age. At the age of 10, he claimed to see the prophet Ezekiel under a tree full of angels. He was interested in art from an early age. Blake attended drawing school and at the age of 14 was apprenticed to an engraver. Following his apprenticeship, William Blake enrolled at the Royal Academy of Art. In 1782, Blake married his wife, Catherine. He taught her to read, to write, design, and print. She served as his greatest support. Blake's brother Robert also passed away around 1787, but even in death had a profound impact on Blake's work. Blake claimed that his brother actually showed him a printing method in his dreams that he used for Songs of Innocence. Now, we have a work by Alexander Gilchrist on the biography of William Blake that was published in 1863, years after Blake passed away. This was the first biography written on him and very much shaped what people know of him and how they perceived him. Gilchrist thoroughly expressed William Blake's eccentricity, describing some of his strange practices, such as how he and his wife would reenact Paradise Lost in full costume. And despite his emphasis on Blake's madness, Gilchrist has an obvious reverence for Blake's work. And I quote, For a nobler depth and beauty, with accordant grandeur of sentiment and language, I know no parallel, nor hit elsewhere as such a poem as The Little Black Boy. We may read these poems again and again, and they continue fresh as at first. There is something unsating in them, a perfume as of a growing violet, which renews itself as fast as it is, as it is inhaled. Now Gilchrist quotes Robert Browning's Pictor Ignotius. Pictor Ignotius means unknown figure. Gilchrist's biography helped put Blake on the map, drawing attention to his work and making it relevant even after Blake had died. And in volume two of the Gilchrist biography, he printed all of Songs of Innocence and Experience, but he didn't print it next to the artwork. Instead, he printed the artwork all together at the end of the volume. This shows us people's initial misunderstanding of Blake. His art was undervalued and not seen as a critical aspect of his work. Now, how would reading The Little Black Boy in Blake's Song of Innocence and Experience without the accompanying artwork change your perception? Now here we have on the left-hand side of your screen Robert Browning's personal copy of Songs of Innocence and Experience given to him by his friend W.A. Dow. This is a first edition. It was given to Browning in 1839. The inscription says W.A. Dow to his friend Browning, April 3, 1839. Now William Blake first published parts of Songs of Innocence and Experience in London in 1789. Songs of Innocence and Experience was written during the Industrial Revolution, which greatly impacted his writing. This was also a time of economic and social t change, and Blake protested against many aspects of the Industrial Revolution, such as the social changes, the injustices, the religious experiences being personal rather than institutional, and the transition from rural to urban environments. Now, this particular edition was published in 1859, many years later and after Blake's death. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was heavily influenced by Blake's work, and as a result, she had very distinct similarities to Blake's poems within her own work. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote The Cry of the Children four years after reading Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience. It's another poem that had similar concept called Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point. So let's take a look at a poem by Elizabeth Barrett Browning and a poem by William Blake. You'll see they have very much a similar presence. First cry of the children. Do you hear the children weeping, O oh my brothers, ere the sorrow comes with years? They are leaning their young heads against their mothers, and that cannot stop their tears. The young lambs are bleeding in the meadows, the young birds are chirping in their nest. 
The young fawns are playing with the shadows. The young flowers are blowing toward the west. But the young, young children, oh my brothers, they are weeping bitterly. They are weeping in the playtime of others, in the country of the free. Let's look at stanzas one and two of The Chimney Sweeper by William Blake. When my mother died when I was very young, and my father sold me, while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep, and in soot I sleep. There's little Tom Dacra who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, hush, Tom, never mind it, for when your head's bare, you know that the soot cannot spoil your white hair. Again, you can see the very much the similarities not only of topic, but of the poetic stance that we have here. We can even see in stanza 11 of Cry of the Children where she brings up the sense of God and the institution of that, that sense of wanting some help from above. We look up for God, but tears have made us blind. And we see that in stanza 5 of William Blake. The naked and white, all their bags left behind, he'd have God for his father and never want. We can also see with the more famous Little Black Boy by William Blake, very much a similar idea in Elizabeth Barrett Browning's later version, Runaway Slave at Pilgrim's Point. I stand on the mark beside the shore of the first white pilgrim's bended knee, where exile turned to ancestor, and God was thanked for liberty. I have run through the night, my skin is as dark. I bend my knee down on this mark. I look on the sky and the sea. I am black, I am black, and yet God made me, they say. But if he did so, smiling back, he must have cast his work away under the feet of his white creatures with a look of scorn that the dusky features might be trodden again to clay. And then Little Black Boy by William Blake. My mother bore me in the southern wild, and I am black, but oh, my soul is white. White as an angel is the English child but I am black as if bereaved of light. Look on the rising sun, there God does live and gives his light and gives his heat away. And flowers and trees and beasts and men receive comfort in morning joy in the noonday. I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear to lean and joy upon our father's knee. And then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair and be like him, and then he will then love me. So as we continue on looking through William Blake, we can see very much a similarity between his first poems and the heavy influence that he put on people like Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. It's more by William Blake, The Sick Rose. O oh, Rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. And another character piece by William Blake, The Little Vagabond. Dear mother, dear mother, the church is cold, but the alehouse is healthy and pleasant and warm. Besides, I can tell where I am used well. Such usage in heaven will never do well. But if at the church they would give us some ale, and a pleasant fire our souls to regale, we'd sing and we'd pray all the live long day, nor ever once wish from the church to stray. Then the parson might preach and drink and sing, and we'd be as happy as birds in the spring. And modest Dame Lurch, who is always at church, would not have bandy children nor fasting nor birch. And God, like a father rejoicing to see 
his children as pleasant and happy as he, would have no more quarrel with the devil or the barrel, but kiss him and give him both drink and apparel. So again, you can see William Blake blasting the ideas of these industrial revolutions coming in, of this new foundation of a middle class society, of going away from the institutional church. There's a lot of discontent with what is coming in in the 1800s that William Blake is living through. So when we take a look finally at William Blake's poems, you want to ask the question, what kind of interpretation does his image invite? Remember, he's an engraver, so usually he's got pictures to go along with his poems. And what kind of interpretation does the poem itself in sequence suggest? Now, the 1839 edition makes many other rearrangements and does not make note of any of the changes from Blake's original copy. However, Blake intentionally rearranged the poems in subsequent distributions of Songs of Innocence and Experience as a way to rebel against this narrative type interpretation of the work. And the inclusion of the grave seems to serve as a powerful bookend for the narrative that this arrangement appears to create. And you can see his last poem in the 1839 edition on the right. Thank you so much for stopping by to learn a little bit about William Blake and his songs of innocence and experience. If you'd like me to go through more of William Blake's poems or you'd like to learn more about his life, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what else I can cover. And as always, I appreciate it if you subscribed. Take care.